Welcome again. Right now we're at John chapter 19, verses 16 through 30. This is talking about the crucifixion. This is just an amazing portion of Scripture. So we just come from the last session where Pilate was very reluctant to have anything to do with the crucifixion of Jesus. He tried time and time again to get out of it. And finally, he delivered Jesus up to the people to do with him as they wanted. We'll start at verse 16. So then he delivered him to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and led him away. He went out bearing his cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha where they crucified him, and with him two others, on either side one, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote a title also and put it on the cross. There was written, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. The chief priests of the Jews therefore said to Pilate, Don't write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier a part and also the coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. And they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it will be, that the scripture might be fulfilled. They parted my garments among them. For my cloak they cast lots. And that's found in Psalm 22, verse 18. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Take note here that when they removed his clothes from him, they removed all of his clothes from him. He didn't have a little napkin wearing around his waist. He didn't have, you know, he didn't have anything on at all, okay? They took all of his garments. They ripped what they, what they ripped, and they saved what they saved. Jesus was hung on the cross, a bloody, brutal mess. You could hardly recognize who he was. Totally naked, because that was part of the torture. That was part of the humiliation. That was part of being crucified, being humiliated to the utmost. Also note, some of you might not be aware, there are some places today that claim to have that particular coat, the seamless coat that Jesus actually wore at the crucifixion. I've looked into several different accounts, and I think the most compelling one out of all of them is the church in Germany that claims to have the actual cloak that Jesus wore when he was crucified. As you can see, the cloak does not look like the type of garment, especially the color of garment that Jesus would wear, especially considering that most paintings today is showing Jesus wearing a white robe or something like that. You know, back in those days, having some, something white was not very common, to say the least. So this robe that Jesus wore was like a brownish color, and that's what it would have been. It would have been something like that, okay? Again, that just shows how much of us have been so, I guess you might call, brainwashed into believing that Jesus went around, you know, with this flowing white, you know, robe or whatever. Not the case whatsoever. I mean, it, people are so... They're so easily influenced by what I call modern-day Christianity today. They're so easily influenced by what they see in movies, what they see in portraits and paintings, and what they hear at church. Verse 25, But standing by Jesus' cross were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Therefore, when Jesus saw his mother... And the disciple whom he loved standing there. Jesus had this disciple that was called the disciple whom he loved. Okay. See, that clearly implies that there were the other disciples that he didn't love or at least didn't love as much. Okay. If you say, okay, out of all of my students, this is the one I love. That implies that this is your favorite. 
I mean, it does more than imply it. it. It's pretty much a proven fact, okay? If you say, out of all my 12 disciples, out of all of my 12 students, this is the one I love, that means that you have a favorite. This one you love more than the rest. Let me point something out to you as well. And I've said this several times in some of my other teachings. And that is that when you read a book out of the Bible, you need to ask yourself, who wrote this book and what level of authority does this person have? And yes, there are different levels of authority. The Jews know this, okay? And don't forget, the Jews are the ones that actually preserved and gave us the scriptures, okay? The Jews know that there are different levels of authority of different books of the scripture, okay? There is the Tanakh, the Old Testament, so-called, the Christians call it the Old Testament, the Jewish people call it the Tanakh, which stands for Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim, T-N-K. And the, the authority of those books are actually in that order. Torah is on the top. Nevi'im is under that. And Ketuvim is under that. In other, in other words, if you see something in the Ketuvim that seems to contradict the Torah, well, go by the Torah, okay? If you see something in the Ketuvim that seems to contradict the Nevi'im, the prophets, We'll go by the prophets, okay? So that is, there is a structure, okay? And it's based upon who actually wrote the book, who actually narrated this, okay? And right here, we've got the book of John, which is one of the most authoritative books in the scope of the so-called New Testament. Why do I say this? Because it was written by John, which is the disciple, the disciple that Jesus loved, Jesus' favorite disciple. Being Jesus' favorite disciple, he would know things about Jesus. He would have a connection with the source that no other disciple ever had. And that's why we see the book of John written in such a way that it's so different from the rest of the Gospels. It's so different than any of the other books. The book of John and also the epistles of John and the book of Revelation, may I add, there, it's just all so different. If you compare them with, let's say, Matthew, Luke, even Paul, you see John says things differently. John has a different point of view. John has inside information. Inside information. Out of all the 12 disciples, we have the three that Jesus took with him to special places that the other nine were not allowed to go. We got Peter, James, and John. I mean, for example, they were allowed to go into a certain room when Jesus raised the dead. None of the other ones saw it. They were outside. You know, Peter, James, and John, they went up to the mountain and they saw the transfiguration of Jesus. None of the others saw it. They were down below. They were, they were not even around, okay? The other nine. So out of the disciples, we have the nine that are kind of the outer circle and the three that are the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. And out of the three, we have John, which is the favorite, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Don't forget that. Don't forget that's why the book of John is so much different than any of the other gospels, okay? Because he was such a different man. He had a connection with, with Jesus. He had a relationship with Jesus that none of the other disciples had. So Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing there. And he said to his mother, behold, your son. Why would Jesus say this? Why would Jesus say such a thing at this time? Well, you see, at this time, again, if there are a lot of documents you should know about, you should read in order to see the full picture. Okay, I know there are a lot of people that believe in, you know, scripture alone, like sola scriptura, like it, it, we only go by scripture, nothing else. Well, you know what? Honestly, you really can't because there are things like this in here that you need more information to understand it, okay? And Scripture alone refers to other books that, you know, some of them we don't even have, but other ones we do have, uh, that you need to read in order to, in order to get the full context of what you're reading. For example... In the so-called New Testament Apocrypha, we read that Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, the 
husband of Mary, uh, died uh, long before this time, long before the crucifixion. So Mary, the mother of Jesus, was alone. Being alone and being a woman in those days, there was no, no source of income whatsoever for her. She needed a man to sustain her, okay? If she didn't have a man, more or less she would die. She, would, she needed a man to sustain her. And so Jesus, by implication, he was the one that was looking after his mother. Joseph wasn't around. Joseph wasn't in the scene. That's why we see, you know, Mary being mentioned, you know, after the birth, where we don't see Joseph being mentioned. I mean, other than just saying, Jesus, this is Joseph's son, but that doesn't mean that he was alive. This here is talking about Mary as obviously she's alive, okay? So Jesus was saying, basically, I'm, this is it for me. I'm dying. Uh, this is my last day. John, you look after my mother. Now she's your mother, okay? You adopt her as your mother, so to speak. Mother, here's your son. Adopt him as your son. Isn't it amazing? And this is further proof that Jesus had one disciple that was his favorite, okay? Is it wrong to play favorites? It doesn't say that in the Bible, okay? It doesn't say that in the Bible. Does Jesus love everybody the same? Absolutely not. It does not. It says the opposite in the in the Bible. Actually, we this is one of many right here. Okay, this is one hard piece of evidence right here that Jesus doesn't love everybody the same. He loved John more than the rest of the disciples. He loved John, therefore he trusted him more. He liked him more. That's why he said, "Okay, mother, here's your son." Okay, he basically designated John to look after his mother. Verse 27, then he said to the disciple, you see, notice it says disciple because John is too humble to mention himself here. Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Awesome. Verse 28, after this, Jesus, seeing that all things were now finished, okay, the NU manuscripts and the Textus Receptus read knowing instead of seeing. So after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I am thirsty. Now a vessel full of vinegar was set there. So they put a sponge full of the vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. And keep in mind, this wasn't food grade, 5% vinegar like we see now in the stores. This probably and could have been a whole lot more stronger than that. Verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now I want to scroll back here a little bit and I want to show you something. Now here we got the phrase, it is finished. And here we got the word now finished, Okay. Now, you know, there's some Christians out there that says, well, Jesus said it is finished. That means no more work, no more this, no more that. You know, the price is paid in full, yada, yada, yada. That's not what he meant here. He just meant I'm done. Like I'm ready to die, okay? He just meant I'm ready to die, okay? Why do I say that? Let's look at the scriptures again here. Up here he says, seeing that all things were now finished, okay? Now, really, they weren't all finished because he still didn't receive the vinegar yet, okay? So, again, take this in context, okay? And you gotta, don't, don't just cut out portions of Scripture, words here, words there, phrase here, phrase there, and develop a whole theology about it. You know, it says here that Jesus saw that all things were finished, but then they weren't finished because... After that, he received the vinegar, and then it says, he said, it is finished. What did he mean by that? He didn't mean, now you don't have to do anything, because no, I mean, obviously, after he died and rose again, he went out and he gave the disciples more commands to do. I mean, it doesn't mean, you know, oh, the battle is over. There's no battle. There's no battle between light and darkness, okay? You, you walk into a room, you turn on the light, do you, is it, it's like, whoa, there's a big battle here. Light is fighting against darkness. No. There's, darkness has no chance against the light. No chance. And that goes with people too. I mean, the only way that people can remain in darkness is if they purposefully blind their eyes to what you're saying. Purposefully 
pull a veil over their heart. And a lot of people do. A lot of people are hiding in their own little world of their own little corner of darkness. They ignore what you say. You know, they don't want to hear you. They ignore you. They block you. You know, and they want nothing to do with you. They're in their own little world of darkness. They don't want to know the truth. They're afraid of the truth. So when Jesus said, it is finished, what he meant was, my life is finished right now. Okay? How do I know that? How do I know that's what he meant? Look at the last half of the verse. Same verse. It says, then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This has nothing to do with putting an end to works. Because after that, we all know that Jesus gave another, um, how many different commands to the to his disciples? Not including the commands that he gave to the church in the book of Revelation when he condemned them for not doing the works that they should be doing. I mean, really condemned, okay? He didn't say, I see your faith. I see your grace. I see my grace on you. I see my righteousness. No, he said, I see your works. You know, I know right now there's a lot of teaching out there that says, all you got to do is accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and, and, and you receive the righteousness of Christ. It's like to put a cloak on you. It's like when God looks upon you, he doesn't see any sin. And all he sees is the righteousness of Christ. Wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Read the book of Revelation. Read Revelation chapter 2 and 3. It says the exact opposite of that. When Jesus came, he didn't come to his to the world. He came to the church, to his church. And he said, I see your works. I know your works. I see the deeds you're doing. I'm upset with you. I'm, I'm not happy with this at all. If you don't repent, you're done. Okay. So when Jesus said it is finished, all he was saying was just, gen, you know, generally speaking, my life's over now. And then he gave up his spirit, which means obviously that he died at that moment. So once again, thanks for listening and may God show you things that just totally blow you away, totally amaze you. And he can and he will if you put that, if you position yourself properly. And I pray that God's presence goes with you and that he leads you into all truth in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Thank you.